Thanks, for, thanks uh, everyone for joining us this morning for the Cary Institute Scientific Seminar Series um, and happy month of March to everybody. It's really great to have folks joining from other places. Um, if you would like to share where you're joining us from, please uh, let us know in the chat box at the bottom. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Liam McGuire as our speaker today. Uh, Dr. McGuire is joining us virtually from the University of Waterloo where he joined the faculty in 2020 as an associate professor in the Department of Biology. Uh, this was a pretty recent move um, back to Canada, where, uh, which took place at the height of COVID, as I understand it. Um, before this, uh, Dr. McGuire spent six years as an assistant professor at Texas Tech University, where he was also affiliated with the Texas Tech Museum. Uh, before Texas Tech, he was a postdoc fellow through NSERC, uh, which is the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council. Um, this is Canada's main federal funding agency for academic research. Uh, during his postdoc, he was also a guest scientist at the Leibniz Institute for Zoo and Wildlife Research in Berlin. Dr. Dr. McGuire is a physiological ecologist. And what I really appreciate about his research program is that it takes a very integrative approach, um, stitches together ecology and evolution with behavior, and physiology and energetics. His research has um, focused on some of the most striking biological phenomena shared by mammals and birds, um, trying to understand the physiology underlying hibernation and torpor, migration and long distance movement ecology, and the consequences of these phenomena for infectious diseases and for species conservation. We've really been looking forward to your talk today, Dr. McGuire. Um, so I'm gonna let you start your screen share. Um, and while he does that, just a quick reminder to everyone that you can share your questions by clicking the Q&A icon that is at the bottom right side of my screen, hopefully on your screen too. Um, and we will field questions at the end. Take it away. Perfect, thanks Barbara. Um, is that screen sharing working all right? You can see the, the title slide there? Yeah, it looks great. Excellent. Um, so yeah, no, thanks very much. This is, this is, I've been really looking forward to this since, well, this was supposed to happen last year and then got delayed again. So I've, I've been looking forward to this for, for quite a long time. Um, I was actually really looking forward to being there in person, uh, but unfortunately, very last minute, COVID had other plans. So um, thanks very much to uh, Barbara and Matt for being nimble and, and uh, reworking this so that we can, we can still do this even in this, this virtual um, format. Uh, so the, the storyline that I want to get into today is, um, so as Barbara mentioned, there's lots of things I get curious and excited about, but I want to I talk about migration today. And this is, a, to me, at least one of these really interesting storylines that's sort of spanned my career where we've gone back and forth between what's going on with birds and what's going on with bats. And we've got these two groups of flying vertebrate endotherms and, and trying to understand how they make these uh, amazing migration movements. So. Um, we'll start back when I was a grad student and go all the way through to some data that I was working on with some of my grad students uh, just earlier this week even. So before we get too far ahead of ourselves, I just want to sort of set the stage and uh, let's get us all very excited about how amazing migration is and some of the, some of the greatest hits and the things that we can all get really excited about. Uh, so black pole warblers. This is a, a 12 gram songbird that has an absolutely amazing fall migration. Um, they will take off they're from the, they gather up in the, the northeastern part of the, of the country here and then jump off and fly 2,500 kilometers over the Atlantic Ocean to arrive at their first stopover site in the Caribbean. Uh, that can take them you know, 60 plus or minus hours, so two and a half days of nonstop flight over the Atlantic Ocean for this little 12 gram songbird before they eventually make their way to their wintering grounds down in South America. And that's even more impressive when you realize that many of these birds have, have had breeding populations as far away as Alaska. So they may have already come from Alaska all the way to the Northeast, and then they make this two and a half day long nonstop flight over the Atlantic Ocean uh, during their fall migration. If we scale up just a little bit, slightly bigger bird now, we got the Northern Weed Ear, a 25 gram songbird. Uh, two main breeding populations for these guys that we can look at. One in Alaska, another one in the Canadian High Arctic. Uh, the population that breeds in Alaska overwinters in eastern Africa. It's a 14,500 kilometer one way migration. So 29,000 kilometers round trip for this 25 gram songbird. The population that breeds in the Canadian high Arctic is, is uh, not quite as long distance, uh, but they, their migration involves a 3,500 kilometer flight across the Atlantic Ocean to get to their wintering grounds in Western Africa. So, so amazing feats of migration here in these still only 25 gram songbirds, they're still fairly small animals. 
But the uh, absolutely undisputed champion of the migration world has to be the bar-tailed godwit. This is a 400 gram shorebird breeds in Alaska, overwinters in New Zealand, and they make that fall migration in one single nonstop flight. There's nowhere to land and stop over the Pacific Ocean. This is a 10,000 kilometer flight that they make in, takes them more than five days of nonstop flight. They don't land, they don't rest, they don't eat, they don't drink, they just flap, 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 nonstop for more than five days. And some individuals, it's, uh, it works out to be about 11,000 kilometers of flight over eight plus days of nonstop flying. Uh, just, just really amazing the, the movements that these animals make. And, and there's lots of other examples that we could get into. We could talk about ruby-throated hummingbirds that migrate across the Gulf of Mexico, or we could talk about all kinds of other fun things. The, the, the take home here though, is that given some of these really amazing feats of migration that uh, have been seen in the bird world, it's not perhaps surprising that there's been a huge amount of research attention that has gone into trying to understand the questions of how and why this all happens. And there's a long list of migratory adaptations that have been documented in terms of understanding the, the how of migration for these birds. So understanding how they use hyperphagia to build up their fat stores, the plasticity of, of digestive and, and exercise organs, uh, how they deal with sleep deprivation, hormonal control, magnetic orientation, all of these things are, are things that have been looked into and we have some understanding of how they work in birds. Set this as a backdrop for, for me coming into this, interested in trying to understand how things happen with bats, because of course, bats are the other group of flying endothermic vertebrates. And we do have bats that migrate, but we know almost nothing about them. Uh, the, the, the field of bat migration is easily 50 years behind where our understanding of bird migration is at. And you know, in some ways that's perhaps understandable because bats can be a little bit trickier to study or a lot trickier to study in some cases. But it's also perhaps a bit surprising because we've known about bat migration for a very long time. Uh, this is a quote from Seahart Merriam back in 1887, where he says, the, the belief that the bats of temperate and cold temperate regions pass winter in a state of hibernation is so general and widespread that an attempt to prove the contrary, even in the case of a single species, is likely to be received with surprise, if not incredulity. So we've known since the late 1800s that there are multiple species of bats that do make these long distance latitudinal type migration, similar to what uh, many of these migratory birds do, but we still know almost nothing about how that works. When I think about migration, I, I tend to think about it in terms of both the pattern and the mechanism, right? The, the who, where, when kind of pattern questions, and then the how mechanism questions. And almost everything that's been done with bat migration research to this point has been largely on that pattern side of things. Um, top left here, I've got some, some data from uh, banding studies where, where people have gone out and uh, attached bands to bats and then recovered them. Um, this, is, uh, this is actually the center point here is Aeolus Cave in Vermont, if you're familiar with the site. This is a, a, a hugely important hibernaculum. You can see this, this regional center point kind of um, radiating mig migration where all the animals hibernate together in the one cave and then spread out across the landscape. Um, unfortunately, in a sad kind of way that we're not going to get too much more into here today, the, the other reason that Aeolus Cave is quite famous these days is it's one of the worst hit sites in terms of uh, white nose syndrome. And some of the early horrific images of all the dead bats from this, this fungal disease that was introduced to North America came out of Aeolus Cave. Um, we also have bats that make more of that, that latitudinal kind of migration like we talked about with birds. On the bottom left here, we've got some band recovery data from some Natusius pipistrels in Europe. And you can see that real consistent northeast to southwest migration track as these, uh, these bats overwinter down in, in France and adjacent areas, and then migrate back up um, towards the, the Lithuania and uh, Latvia and, and on that way. And with this kind of data, people have got, you know, got out lists and categorized things. And so there's been attempts, um, we've got the, the phylogeny here on the right, and the species names don't matter so much, but the fact that there's black boxes and gray boxes and white boxes. So we've got some short distance migrants or long distance migrants or species that are non-migratory, all these sort of gathering up the patterns of, of migration. But the mechanism, how they actually do this is, is largely unknown. And it's, it's very important that we actually start to figure that out and start to answer some of these questions about how this works, uh, because we do have a, a very serious problem that we're dealing with right now. And that's, that's the problem of, of bat mortality at wind energy facilities. You know, there, there's a lot to like about, uh, about wind energy. You know, this is clean, green, renewable energy. Uh, but it's not without uh, some, some problems. Um, recent estimates have, uh, well, not even so recent, actually from several years ago now, have estimated that uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 128,000 bats 
that are killed by wind turbines each year. That's um, this is a hoary bat here. This is one of our, our long distance North American migratory species. So when there's 128,000 hoary bats killed at these wind turbines each year, you gotta start to wonder how much of an issue is that? And, and the challenge is that we just, we don't know enough about the basic biology and the basic natural history of the species to really answer that question. So to try and get around that, uh, I was part of a, a group that participated in a, a structured decision-making exercise organized by the Fish and Wildlife Service. And we got together and we started putting together the bits and pieces of what we did know to try and build out some, some population models to try and estimate under various scenarios how much of an impact does this mortality at these wind turbines actually have on the population of these bats. One of the encouraging things that we found was that given all of the bits and pieces of information that we gathered up, in the absence of mortality at wind turbines, um, that's this blue series here. Uh, our estimate was that actually the population was likely to be growing in the absence of this mortality. The downside is that once you start layering on 128,000 dead bats a year, those populations start to decline quite rapidly. And of all the different scenarios that we ran, the most likely scenario indicated that we would be looking at potentially a 90% population decline of hoary bats over the next 50 years. That's a shocking number. The, the, the more important take home to me is that of all the scenarios that we ran, in all but the absolute most optimistic, and what I would probably argue is un, unrealistic, but it, unless you're taking the absolute best case scenario in every possible aspect of the model, uh, we have a serious problem here. And Horibat populations are declining and they're declining rapidly. And so we, we need to figure out what's going on and how we might be able to do something about that. So how do we approach this system? How do we get into studying and understanding what's going on with bat migration when we really know so little about these bats and there hasn't been near the, the background amount of work done that would really help to set us up to answer these questions? And as a graduate student, uh, I took the approach, uh, I took a comparative approach. It's okay, well, we've got all kinds of great information that we know about migrating birds and bats and birds are both flying vertebrate endotherms that make these long distance latitudinal migrations. So perhaps it's not a bad hypothesis that there's some degree of convergence in the way that these animals make these migratory movements. So can we use what we know about bird migration to set up predictions about how bat migration might work and then we can go and start testing those kind of things. So that's that's what I did. And then that's, that's where our stories are gonna come from for, for the rest of the talk here is how we've built from that basic premise. So the first story I want to tell you about is a story with uh, silver-haired bats. So this is another one of our North American long-distance migrants. Um, long-distance, when we talk about long-distance migratory bats, it's a totally different scale from what we talk about with long-distance migratory birds. We don't have any bar-tailed godwood equivalents, but our, our silver-haired bats and our hoary bats, they're migrating over a thousand kilometers between summer and wintering grounds. Ish, probably, we think because we don't actually uh, really know where, they're, where the, the core breeding populations are or where they're overwintering, or in fact, actually where they're going in between. There's a lot of indirect evidence. So for, for the silver-haired bats, at least in the Eastern part of the, of the continent, uh, we have reason to believe that they're breeding up somewhere in Northern Ontario, maybe into Quebec, and they're overwintering somewhere down in the Southeast. So that, that you know, puts it at about a thousand kilometers from breeding to wintering ground. Um, incidentally, silver-haired bats are one of the best scientific names if you go back into the etymology of understanding what, you know, what's the root of the name, Lazionicterus noctivagans, you can translate that loosely into the shaggy haired bat that wanders the night, which I think is just a, a, a wonderful uh, way of thinking of these guys. So as these shaggy haired bats are wandering the night during these, these migrations, um, of course they don't make that, that full migration, that thousand kilometers all in one go. This is a series of flights and stopovers along the way, same as you'd expect for a migratory bird. And that gives us an opportunity to get in and study these bats where they're going to arrive at one of these predictable stopover sites. So if we zoom in on the Great Lakes here, uh, this, is, this is Lake Erie. So you've got uh, Buffalo is here, Toronto is up here, uh, Detroit down over here, and there's Cleveland. Uh, there's a very prominent geographic feature on the north shore of Lake Erie. This is Long Point, Ontario. And home to the Long Point Bird Observatory, which is the, uh, the longest running bird, mi uh, bird migration monitoring uh, site in the Western Hemisphere. Doesn't take a whole lot of imagination to see why this is a great place to study animals, especially during fall migration. You've basically got a giant funnel that concentrates all these animals. So the, the banding station is sort of right about here, just part way out onto that peninsula. And as it turns out, the places that you can go and catch lots of birds during migration look like they're similarly effective at catching lots of bats during migration. So that's what I did. I went out and I was catching silver-haired bats during my, uh, migration at the Long Point Bird Observatory. 
at the time, I was able to um, take advantage of, of uh, you know, some, some great collaborators that were setting up a, a regional scale automated telemetry network. So what we've got is um, we've got the whole peninsula here. So recall the banding station is right near this, this point here. Each one of these blue balloons is a tower that has a, a radio telemetry receiver. And each of the red lines are the antennas on those towers, indicating the direction the antenna is facing. And the, the length of those lines is roughly proportional to the detection range as best we can figure it. So we've got three towers on the peninsula proper, one at the base of the peninsula and one a little farther inland. The real technological advance here that allowed us to, to do this work was the advent of digitally coded radio transmitters. So prior to this, the conventional radio tracking approach is that you have a bunch of different radio tags that are all on different frequencies. And so to track individual animals, you have to take your receiver and cycle between each of these different frequencies so that you know that the tag I'm hearing on this frequency is this animal and the tag I'm hearing on that frequency is that animal. But with the digitally coded transmitters, all of these tags are on the same frequency, but with a unique digital identifier. So now we can track any animal carrying a tag at any given time. So now all of these towers are always listening for any animals out there carrying a, a radio transmitter. So we can catch an animal, attach a tag. Here's one of our, uh, our tags on a silver haired bat here, release the animal. And as long as they're within range of one of these towers, we know where they're moving about and what they're, what they're up to. And this is, uh, this is the data that we get looks something like this. So I'm just gonna walk through this here a little bit slowly to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, so recall, we've got our five towers going from inland all the way out to the tip of the peninsula. And we've got five panels in this left figure, which correspond to those towers. So going from inland all the way to the tip of the peninsula in that top panel. Within each of those panels, we've got four different data series. Those are the different antennas and the colors indicate the direction of the antenna. We've got time and date on the X axis and then uh, signal strength or power on the Y axis, which gives us some idea of proximity of the tag to that, uh, to that tower. So what we're looking at here is a silver haired bat that we caught the morning of September 12th, just before dawn, tagged the bat, released it, and very shortly after we tagged it, that animal didn't move around a whole lot and very quickly went and found somewhere to roost for the day, right close to that park tower, which is right close to where we have the banding station where we were catching that animal, right? So that, that one there, it's just, just part way out on the peninsula. We then get a, a stable signal throughout the day as the bat is sitting in a roost, it's not moving, it's not flying around. Sometime around, around supper time, bat had an itch or got squirmy or just kind of twisted a little bit and the signal got uh, got a little clearer for the tower to hear so the signal strength jumped but the bat is still in the still in the roost and in the right here i've zoomed in on just the final part of that uh, data track so now we're looking at just the park the dune and the tip tower so the three towers that are on the peninsula proper and you can see exactly where that animal emerged from its roost that stable signal goes away and now we start to get variable signals the animals flying around and within you know, minutes of emerging from the roost, we're starting to pick up that bat on the west facing antenna of that dune tower as it approaches. So the bat was roosting here and is now moving its way out. We're picking it up on this antenna here. That signal strength starts to increase. We start to get simultaneous detections on the west facing antennas of those two towers out at the tip. And then we get a couple of hits here on the north and south facing antennas of that tip tower. And then the signal fades away on the east facing antenna of that tip tower. So here's a bat that arrived. We caught it just before dawn, tagged it, spent the day roosting right near the, the tower here, uh, just partly out on the peninsula. And then the following evening, right at sunset, it flew the length of the peninsula, passed right over top of that tower at the tip of the peninsula. And last we saw it was flying out over the lake. Here's another example of an animal that did something slightly different. Same basic idea in the way the data is presented. Uh, we bat, in this case, we caught a silver-haired bat just before dawn on the morning of August 27th. And again, very quickly after we released the bat, it went and found somewhere to roost right nearby that, that park tower right near where we caught it. And again, we'll zoom in on the, the last bit of that data track here on the right. You can see where the bat emerged from the roost. And very quickly, we start to see that signal is uh, fading away on that west-facing antenna of the park tower. And then we see the signal increase and then decrease as the bat has flown west away from that tower and then passed almost perpendicularly through the beam of that southwest facing antenna of that uh, BSC tower. So this is a bat that we believe has turned around and gone back along the lakeshore rather than flying the distance across along the length of the peninsula and taking off across the lake. So two different scenarios here of, of the kinds of uh, arrival, stopover and departure kind of patterns that we saw. But in both cases here, 
These bats were not around for long. They arrived at dawn and they were gone again the following evening, rain at dusk. And that is consistent with what we saw in most of these animals. Uh, here I'm plotting out the stopover duration that we estimated for all these animals. What I'm calling a zero day stopover duration is a bat that was not present for any active periods. It arrived, it stayed through the inactive period and then immediately again. And that was the most common response. We did have a few animals that did stay for one night, so one active period. In all but one of those cases, it was raining that night. So it makes some sense they, they decided to stick around for an extra night rather than trying to continue migrating in the rain. And then, of course, anytime you're working with wild animals, it's always a, a couple of animals that decide to throw you a bit of a monkey wrench. And I've got one bat that stayed for two weeks and one bat that stayed for three weeks. And I've got no good explanation for, for what's going on with those two. Those are just, they don't all do the same thing. And that, that, that in and of itself is interesting. But that's, that's what we've got here. Most of these bats are arriving at dawn and departing at dusk the following day. So just that zero or one day stopover duration. At the same time that I was doing this work, there was another group that was doing the exact same work with black-throated blue warblers. So uh, a songbird, similar body mass, exact same calendar dates, exact same radio transmitters on the exact same towers, meaning we've got the exact same weather conditions. And what they got is, is much more like what you would expect to see for a typical stopover duration pattern in, in migrating birds, where these birds are mostly sticking around for you know, four or five days, maybe a week. And it's not uncommon to have birds that are sticking around for longer than a week. So a, a stark contrast in the pattern of stopover duration between these migratory birds and the migratory bats, which of course begs the question of why don't the bats stay longer? What's different? There's gotta be something that explains why we see such a contrast here. And we think the answer to that question is, is the cost of homeothermic. Uh, migrating birds are, are homeothermic. They, they have to spend a lot of energy to maintain that normal body temperature. And there's a good amount of uh, both theoretical and empirical literature that would suggest that birds spend about seven times longer and twice as much energy at stopover sites compared to the periods of migratory flight. Right? So fly, stop, refuel, fly, stop, refuel, fly, stop, refuel, meaning that those periods of flight actually only account for about a third of the total energy expenditure during migration. That, that increased cost uh, at these stopover sites is largely due to the cost of thermoregulation. This is some work with uh, migrating swains instructions that uh, Martin Wachowski and colleagues did where they worked out what's the energy expenditure of these birds at stopover sites compared to the ambient conditions they experience. And the colder it gets, the more energy these birds are spending at these stopover sites because they have to shiver to stay warm. So that, that, that's pointing to this cost of homeothermia as, as a big part of this explanation. But bats, of course, uh, at least the bats that we're dealing with, are fantastic heterotherms. They use torpor all the time. So it might just be that these bats are arriving and rather than shivering and spending a ton of energy to stay warm, they can just go into torpor and avoid those costs. So a few years later, back to Long Point again, this time with some temperature sensitive radio transmitters in hand. And so we can go and look and see what these bats are doing in terms of uh, using torpor to deal with these environmental challenges. And long story short, every single bat that we tracked used torpor every single day that we tracked it. But the way that they used torpor varied from, from day to day. Um, so all these plots are presented the same. We'll start with the one on the left here. This is on one of the warmest days of that study. It was mean ambient temperature during the daytime roosting period. It was about 27 degrees Celsius. Um, in all these plots, we've got vertical lines for sunrise and sunset. The red dots are the ambient temperature. The black dots are the skin temperature of the bat. And that dashed black line is uh, a threshold that we calculated to differentiate between when the animal is at normal body temperature or when it's below normal body temperature. So on that very warm day, uh, this bat here used torpor for a little while in the morning and then warmed up to normal body temperature and stayed there for the remainder of the day and then departed from the site right at sunset. In the middle, we've got one of our um, sort of medium kind of days. It was about 22 degrees Celsius. Torpor in the morning, pop up to normal body temperature in the afternoon, second bout of torpor in the evening, and again, warming back up and departing from the site right at sunset. And then on the right, we got one of our cooler days where the mean ambient temperature was only 18 degrees Celsius. And this bat was torpid for the entire day. But again, right at sunset, the bat warms up and is out of there. So we've got torpor use in the bats in the field under varying environmental conditions. The other thing we did was we held bats for the day in a temperature cabinet, which we can set to different temperatures to mimic the range of conditions that these animals would experience at the site. And we used respirometry to measure their metabolic rate in response to those different conditions. And some of these animals decided that they didn't want to use torpor and they defended their normal body temperature. And that's what these open circles are here. 
And some of them use torpor, which is these filled circles down the bottom here. So this, this top plot here, or the, the open circles here, that looks a lot like what we just saw for those Swainston thrushes, where the colder it gets, the more energy these animals are spending. But when they use torpor, their metabolic rate comes down to almost zero. They're spending very, very little energy when they're torpid. So now with these fit lines, we can go back and we can say, knowing what the ambient temperature is and whether the bat was torpid or at normal body temperature, we can apply the, these curves and we can calculate what would be the energy expenditure of that bat. And we can compare that to what would have been the energy expenditure had the bat remained at normal body temperature for the entire daytime period. And as it turns out, the, the mean, mean ambient temperature is a major predictor of how much energy they save. The colder it gets, the more torpor these bats use. And that's that, that increasing difference between these two lines. The colder it gets, there's a much greater dif difference between the amount of energy a normal temperature bat would spend compared to a torpid bat. And these bats can save 90% or more of the total energy that they would have had to have spent if they had not used torpor. So huge energy savings here as these bats have experienced variable conditions in the environment. So this is what we're referring to as the idea of torpor-assisted migration, the idea that bats can use torpor during migration to minimize their non-flight energy costs. If this is the case, then these bats are sparing their fuel stores and being able to use those instead of shivering to keep themselves warm, they can use those fuel stores for subsequent periods of migratory flight, which means they don't need to spend as much time foraging to rebuild those fuel stores at these stopover sites, which means they don't need to have the long stopovers that we see in birds and they can get away with these shorter stopovers. But if they're reducing that energy cost of thermoregulation at the stopover site, which represents two thirds of the total energy cost of migration in birds, then it may be that they're able to reduce the overall energy required in migration quite substantially compared to birds. And this might actually then translate into reduced mortality risk for these bats. So lots of implications of using torpor at these stopover sites. So we wanted to go back and then, and then keep playing with this. And so the, I, I quite appreciate the approach of, of alternating between sort of empirical work and theoretical work. So the next step here was to go back into the, to the theory and, and redevelop the theory to account for this, this idea of using heterothermia during migration. There's a fantastic theoretical framework. It's optimal migration theory, first put out there by Allerstein and Lindstrom back in 1990. And it's a, a, a theoretical modeling framework based on optimization of three different currencies during migration. So either time, energy, or predation risk. And you can use this framework to, uh, to, to, to model all kinds of different scenarios to understand the decisions that animals make, whether it's how long to stay at a stopover site, how, uh, how large a fats load should they build up, uh, should they stay or should they go, all kinds of things that you can work into uh, based on this, this modeling framework. And if we take the, 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 the basic idea that predation risk is probably not a major issue for migratory bats, and for many migratory birds, it may not be as big of a deal certainly not as big a deal as time and energy, what you're left with is a basic trade-off between time and energy. So a migrant, a migrant could migrate faster, a migrant could migrate faster, but it would cost them more energy, or they could migrate more efficiently, but it's gonna take longer. So you've got this trade-off between time and energy in this modeling framework. So my, uh, my former PhD student, Jeff Clerk, he just, just dove into this and rework the optimal migration theory framework to account for the possibility of using heterotherm. As currently, as originally developed, optimal migration theory assumes strict homeotherm, right? It does not allow at all for any degree of homeo or heterothermy during stopover periods. So we get this trade-off and we really want to get into thinking about the idea of energy balance and, and building up those fuel stores at these stopover sites. So energy balance, of course, is just the difference between energy intake and energy output. For homeotherms, they're almost entirely restricted to manipulating that energy balance by manipulating the energy intake. So what we're looking at here is the net refueling rate. But during uh, we got a migrant at a stopover site. During the active phase, they can go out, they can forage, and they can build up their their fuel stores. Then in the inactive phase, they use up some of those fuel stores uh, because they're not actively foraging; they're maintaining their metabolism. But also, they're probably having to shiver to stay warm. So that, that thermoregulation is chewing up some of those fuel stores. And so the next day they can build them up again. And the next night they lose some again. And so we end up with this net refueling rate here is this dotted line. For a homeotherm, there's not much they can do about that nighttime energy expenditure. They have to shiver to stay warm. That's what they're going to do. So the only way to increase the net refueling rate 
is to increase the rate of energy intake. They've got to find stopover sites where there's lots of food available and they can eat more during the day, such that when they give back the same amount of energy at night, the net refueling rate increases, right? So a homotherm can only increase that net refueling rate by increasing the rate of energy intake. Heterotherms, by comparison, even if they maintain the exact same rate of energy intake during the day, they can reduce that rate of energy expenditure at night and achieve a similar increase in that net refueling rate in spite of not increasing those energy intake. They can reduce the energy output. So now we can, we can continue to build this model that makes all kinds of interesting predictions that we can then go out and test. Here's the, the flight range curve, which is another component of the model. And it's basically looking at this idea of, of diminishing returns. So as these animals spend longer at stopover durations, they're building up their fuel stores and they can use that fuel to fly a certain distance. The more fat that they build up, the farther they can go, but the more fat they build up, the heavier they get, the more weight they have to carry and that flight becomes less efficient. And so you end up with this, this dim, diminishing, recur, uh, diminishing returns type curve. When you feed in this model with these expected costs and trade-offs in these currencies for homeothermic and heterothermic migrants, what comes out of that model is that the, for the optimal stopover duration, heterotherms are predicted to have a much shorter optimal stopover duration than the homeotherms. Heterotherms can reach that target fuel load much faster than can the, the homeotherms. That's consistent with what we saw in our silver-haired bats and our black-throated blue warblers, right? Our silver-haired bats had short duration stopovers where the black-throated blue warblers were longer. Another prediction that comes out of this is that the heterothermic migrants should have relatively smaller fat stores. They don't need to build up a huge fat store because they're not using a ton of that fat during these inactive periods. This is a really tricky one to test because you need to have a system where you've got both homeothermic and heterothermic migrants within the same species to compare. And for the most part, a species is going to be either homeothermic or heterothermic. Jeff found a neat way around this with spring migrating uh, hoary bats. During spring migration, the females uh, hoary bats are actually pregnant. So they, they uh, ovulate and become pregnant prior to spring migration. So they're migrating while they're pregnant with twins. That's a whole other mind blowing situation on its own. But what that means is that the female hoary bats during spring migration don't use torpor because of the potential detrimental effects on the developing fetus, but the males have no reason not to. And they, they, are, they use torpor left, right, and center all over the place. So now we have a comparison of males and females, homeothermic and heterothermic migrants within the same species at the same site. Off to New Mexico, uh, Jeff took, we had a, a quantitative magnetic resonance body composition analyzer and uh, looked at the, the fuel load in these animals. And sure enough, as predicted by the model, the females have a, the homeothermic females have a larger fuel load than the heterothermic males. So some more evidence to suggest that these models are in fact working the way we think they should be. And there's a bunch of other predictions that come out as well. Uh, and one of them that I think is really interesting is the idea that heterothermic migrants, because they don't rely on those high fuel intake, they can reduce energy output, means that they're probably less constrained to high quality stopover habitat. For homeotherms, the only way they can increase that net refueling rate is they've got to find somewhere that's got great habitat, lots of food, so they can really increase that food intake. Heterotherms can probably move more broadly across the landscape because they, they can kind of be wherever. It doesn't matter. Even for lower uh, fuel intake, they can still maintain that higher net refueling rate because of that reduction of the non-active period energy costs. So how do you test that? And this is where the, the MODIS wildlife tracking system comes in. Back when we started this work, we had just those five towers at Long Point. We didn't have a name for it, but that, that, those five towers have now exploded into what we now call the MODIS Wildlife Tracking System. This is an open source collaborative network um, from those original five towers at Long Point. There's now more than 1,200 towers in more than 30 countries. Um, and actually, even this map here is out of date. I need to update this. There's, there's plenty more towers that are filled in all over the place. And we're actually I'm working on a grant right now to do another big expansion of this network as well. So this has really exploded. And now we can track animals over much greater distances because there's towers all over the place. Uh, go check out modus.org. There's all kinds of really neat stuff there about this, this tracking network. So this is now several years ago, but the, at the time, this is where we had our original five towers at one point. You can see how the, the network has now greatly expanded. Southern Ontario is pretty well covered. Um, Pennsylvania is starting to fill in. I, went, I got some, some grant money and we put in some towers on the south shore of Lake Erie. So now we can go back and we can repeat that study, but we can now track what happens with the animals when they leave Long Point, when they're not just at the stopover area itself, where do they go when they leave? 
And part of the motivation here was to try and understand the two examples I showed you, the one bat that took off across the peninsula and the one bat that went back around the lakeshore, that kind of shook out about 50-50. Half of the animals that we track went across the lake, we think, and half went back around the shoreline, we think. So we want to find out if that is, in fact, what these animals are doing. And the real impetus for this, this research was funded uh, with the idea of offshore wind energy. There was a, a sense that um, bats, of course, don't fly out over open water. So wind energy, wind towers out in the lake wouldn't pose a risk to migrating bats. So we wanted to, to gather some data to, to really test that idea of whether these bats are, in fact, flying out over the lake or not. So back we go and we tag bats, same as before, at the bird observatory, release them, and now we've got this much broader network of towers to check to track them. Conveniently, there were some animals that we caught that had taken the time to actually read our proposal. Very, very, very helpful. Um, here we've got three examples of those kind of animals where we caught the bat at the bird observatory, flew along the length of the peninsula, took off across the lake, and arrived on the south shore. Um, one in the middle here flew part way out, didn't go all the way to the tip, but still flew across the lake and arrived on the south shore. Or an animal that flew part way across the uh, peninsula, took off, and then eventually wound up on this island, this Peely Island at the middle of the lake. Uh, all cases of clear evidence of bats flying out over the lake as they depart from this site during fall migration. In each of these, um, in these, in these uh, maps I'm showing you, the black X's here are towers that are on the landscape, and the red dots and the connected lines are the tracks of the bats that we've got. The other group of bats that uh, took the time to read the proposal, turn around, go back around the shoreline. Turn around, go back around the shoreline. So we've got bats that are doing those, th basically the two examples that I showed you earlier. Now we've got tracks away from just Long Point proper to see that that's in fact what these animals are doing. But we also had some animals that were, were interesting in the sense that they, they kind of only skimmed the proposal. They looked at it quickly, said something, 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 lakeshore, yeah, yeah, got it, got it, got it. But they got the wrong lakeshore. Rather than going back around the Lake Erie lakeshore, recall this is southbound fall migration, we're expecting to be going south. These bats turned around and went back up along the north shore of Lake Ontario, something I never would have predicted or guessed. And it really kind of highlights the value of this kind of broad scale tracking network to, to really learn that the animals are doing some really unexpected things. Um, for reference, this, this would be Toronto here. So here we got an animal that's migrating potentially right through Toronto, big major urban center during its migration period in a seasonally, what I would have referred to as a seasonally inappropriate direction. And then of course, we've got some animals that just absolutely couldn't be bothered to read the proposal at all. They didn't even look at it. They just did whatever the heck they wanted to do anyway. Southbound fall migration, caught the bat, released it. Instead of moving south, this bat then flew 300 kilometers north up to the tip of the Bruce Peninsula. So this is Lake Huron up here now. And then came back down south and then went back up north again. It eventually made its way around the western edge of Lake Erie. In the middle, we've got a bat that kind of bopped around Southern Ontario for a bit and then down to Indiana and then back up again. So over 600 kilometers down and then back again. And the last time we saw that bat, it was actually farther north than where we had initially tagged it. And then another example of a bat that goes all the way up the Bruce Peninsula and back down out of its way again. So a couple of just mind boggling things here. First of all, totally unexpected, these kind of movements. Second of all, the distances involved. Recall early on, I said these silver-haired bats, we think they're moving about 1,000 kilometers from breeding to wintering. Well, here we've got animals that are moving about 1,000 kilometers or more for no net displacement. They haven't made it any farther south. And in fact, they may actually be further north the last time we saw them. And they've already done that 1,000 kilometers. So the total migration path is surely much, much longer than that net 1,000 kilometers that they might move from start to finish. And this also has all kinds of interesting concerns when you think about wind energy and mortality of wind turbines, where we had been thinking about bats you know, moving from north to south, they have to pass through those wind energy facilities. Well, now they might be going back around and passing through them multiple times, increasing the risk that they're exposed to. So we started to think about this in terms of whether this is a case of migration or migratory wandering. How do we think of what these kind of movements are? And we really don't know what's going on here. This, this could be the short answer we've settled on for right now, at least, is that they're doing it because they can. They're using torpor every day. They don't need to be at these high quality stopover sites. They can kind of stop wherever they want. So maybe this is enabling them to go exploring and gathering information about potential future breeding sites. Or maybe fall migration is the breeding season. We know that. So maybe this is an opportunity that there's some sort of social interaction going on here, where by wandering all over the landscape, it's more likely that males and females that have spent the summer separated are going to encounter each other during this fall migration breeding season. Maybe there's something to do with that. Where this gets more interesting for me then is to go back to the birds again. And, and yeah, our Swainson thrushes on the one end, our 
strictly homeothermic. That, there's not much question there. And our bats on the other end are really fantastically heterothermic, but there's a whole continuum in the middle. We know that hummingbirds use torpor during migration. We know that black cap warblers over in the old world don't use torpor, but when they are in sufficiently poor body condition, they can actually drop their body temperature a few degrees, something along the lines of what we're thinking of. We know that some of the, uh, the capromulgids can use torpor, but whether they do it during migration or not, we don't know. And so that's what my, my I've got a, a graduate student right now who's working on this question is understanding to what extent is heterothermia a thing in migratory birds where we just haven't looked at it before. So there are lots of different things that we could think of in terms of predictors of, of species likely to use heterothermia to some degree, the body size, body condition, diet, migratory diet timing. And so ruby crown kinglets would be probably one of the most obvious, right? Tiny little birds, high surface area to volume ratio are gonna lose a lot of heat while they're shivering to try and stay warm. If they're in poor body condition, they don't have a whole lot of uh, fat reserve that they can rely on. And they, they migrate very early in the spring and very late in the fall. So they're exposed. In this case, look at the snow in the background, right? This is the kind of conditions they might experience. So what Ryan's doing is using temperature sensitive pit tags. So we just put a little um, passive integrated transponder into these birds, which we can then monitor their temperature every 10 seconds or so while we've got them in a temperature cabinet, like what I showed you for the bats earlier. So we can get both body temperature and metabolic rate using respirometry under the range of temperature conditions they might expect. We're working that data up right now, but just a bit of a sneak preview of one of the things I think is most exciting is that we are, in fact, seeing these birds drop in their body temperature overnight. Obviously not nearly as dramatic as what the bats do, but here we've got a ruby crown kinglet that's dropping its body temperature down to about 36 degrees overnight and then warming back up again right at dawn. So the same kind of thing that we we're seeing in the bats, different different magnitude, but the same kind of pattern. And so we're working out now, what are the energetic consequences of these kinds of over, overnight uh, thermoregulation strategies? And how does that then play into all the other uh, carryover effects for all the other aspects of migration? And it's not just uh, ruby crown kinglets, golden crown kinglets, brown creepers, even some of the species that we didn't really expect, like myrtle warblers, we're starting to see some respectively cool body condition or uh, cool body temperatures in the overnight periods for, for several of these species. So this may in fact be a strategy that's that's more widespread than we've currently appreciated. So to close it all out, um, uh, there's, a, there's a quote, so Hugh Dingle sort of literally wrote the book on migration. He's got a fantastic book about this. And there's a quote from that book that I think kind of encapsulates my, my perspective on a lot of this. The idea that some of these classic examples of migration, they may be extreme cases and the exception rather than the rule. So when we're thinking about bird migration, and they go from here to here and they have this body temperature and they're using this energy and all this kind of stuff. That is just sort of one extreme of the whole potential continuum of migration strategies. Investigating migratory adaptations that may seem less complete than these may prove especially revealing and gradations between migration and other movements should provide interesting insights. And that's, that's what we're getting at with this idea of heterothermic migration strategies and these migratory wandering kind of movements and all the other fantastic things that, uh, that we're getting into. So I'm um, going to continue playing with this kind of stuff here for, for years to come, I'm sure. So with that, um, thank you very much for, for having me. And thanks to a huge number of people who put a huge amount of work into some of the data that I present here today and lots of fantastic funding agencies along the way as well. Thanks especially to uh, Barbara for inviting me and to uh, Barbara and Matt for being nimble and, and making the last minute change to, to facilitate the, keeping us on schedule here and making this happen. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Liam. That was an incredible talk. I think that I was laughing and um, gasping in shock at various points throughout your talks. So it was really, really cool stuff. Um, I'm going to remind folks that, especially those of us who are at Cary who might be in our offices and want to ask a question in person, that you can raise your hand. There's a raise hand function at the bottom of your screen that you can use if you want to ask your question live. Um, I have a couple of questions to ask you, but we also have some that have been submitted by our listeners, so maybe we'll start there. I'll just um, field some of these questions for for those of us who are for those who are online. Um, the the first so there there are a couple of questions about um, turbines and and the wind part of your story. Um, and this question asks: Can't some sound device be added to the turbines? A sound that we can't hear, but the bats can. Yes, so, so the, there are people that are working on this now. It's, it's um, the idea of active mitigation. Um, so there's systems that are in development that would place bat detectors on the nacelle of turbines. This part of the problem is that you, know, you appreciate that wind turbines are huge, but you may not appreciate how huge they are until you get right up to one. The, the nacelle is 90 meters up there. It's way up there. 
So when we go in and do surveys before construction, the bat detectors at the ground level can't reach the bat activity up at that height. So we, we have no way of knowing what's going on up there before the bats arrive. And in fact, some of the studies now are suggesting that bats may actually be attracted to these turbines. And there's some hypotheses about why that might be. But in any case, the idea is that put bat detectors on the, on the nacelle of these turbines, and then when they hit some threshold of bat activity, they could shut the turbines down and then the bats could pass through safely and then they could resume operation when, when the bats aren't around anymore. Or could they emit some kind of an ultrasonic frequency that would deter the bats? Um, to my understanding, and, and there may be new stuff that I haven't seen yet, the, the sound emission hasn't worked particularly well just yet. And part of that is because these ultrasonic frequencies attenuate very rapidly in the environment. They don't, they don't transmit very far. Active mitigation has proved to be uh, successful, although it's fairly complicated to set up such a system. The real frustrating thing is we have a very simple solution. We know that bats are not getting killed during the day. They're only getting killed at night. They're not getting killed in the summer. They're not getting killed in the winter, largely primarily just fall migration. And they're not getting killed at the high wind speeds that are actually best for producing wind energy, only at lower wind speeds when it's more conducive to flying bats. So there have been studies that have shown you can drastically reduce you know, 80% or more the mortality of bats at wind energy facilities by just shutting off the turbines on nights when the wind speed is low during the right time of year, when you're likely not to be producing much energy anyway, just turn them off and that, that, that'll do it. So we don't have to think about super complicated uh, strategies. They're just a real simple, turn off the turbines when it's not great for producing energy anyway, and the bats are moving through, that'll solve most of this problem. But that becomes a, uh, an issue of, of policy and whatnot at that point. Yeah. Um... I, yeah, I, I have all these questions to ask about what, how the wind um, industry has responded to some of the work that you and others have done and these sort of simple solutions, but maybe maybe we'll save that for when I talk to you in person. Um, sure. Gary Lovett asks, are the bats migrating singly or in groups? And maybe that sort of ties to the wind story a, a little bit as well. Yep. Short answer, we don't know. Medium answer, I don't think so. Um, on the one hand, when I'm out there sitting out in the dark with my mist nets and waiting for the bats to arrive, I'll go days and days and days without catching a bat. And then all of a sudden I'll catch 20 or 30 bats in one mm. minute. So that might suggest that they're moving through in a group, but they're scattered over several hours. So I think it's actually more so that the, the conditions are right and the season's right and they're just kind of all coming through over a period of a few days. But um, one of the suggestions early on was that it, there might be uh, bats that are flying together where it might be young of the year that are following adults learning the migration route. Um, Erin Bearwald, who's at uh, University of Northern British Columbia, has done some really neat work where she went out and collected bats that have been hit by turbines in pairs and did the genetic testing and confirmed that they're actually no more related than would be expected by random chance. So they may be moving together in terms of small groups, perhaps. Um, certainly doesn't look like there's any sort of family uh, relatedness in terms of what's going on. More likely, I think that the bats that are getting, and then I'm totally speculating, but this is my, this is mating season, right? So it, it may well be that males are territorial and chasing off other males or males are chasing females. And in that, that distracted close interaction, that might be where some of these bats are getting hit by these turbines. Hmm, interesting. Um, Another related to that is, is it's, it's not even necessarily the bats actually have to get hit by the turbine blade. Um, bats have typical mammalian lungs, or basically big balloons, whereas birds have the more rig rigid avian lung. So when those turbine blades are, are spinning, again, it doesn't look so fast from the ground, but when you start doing the math and you've got a, a 50 meter blade that's spinning around, it's really moving. It makes this, this wicked low pressure zone. And as the bats may be able to avoid the blade itself, but then this rapid pressure change, they actually have rupturing in some of the, the lung tissue. And so they get this, uh, what they call barrow trauma, and they end up just sort of drowning in their own fluids and so we don't know how many bats are actually dying away from the turbines from these indirect kind of uh, situations oh, that's horrible um okay i have a i have another question here from roger that has to do with um migration in general um he, he says i've also i've always been puzzled by how it's possible for any animal to decide when and how to navigate to distant destinations Genetics, of course, but is it difficult? But it is difficult to imagine how it works. Does science really have any idea? Big question. <laughs> <laughs> big so question. There's, there's, there are some there are some really neat things out there. Um, 
so so one study that immediately comes to mind um there was a group and i'm forgetting the author's name right now and i should know um that did a translocation experiment with some white crown sparrows that they brought them uh they, this is a western population that would have been expected to migrate down to southern california and they translocated them over to new jersey and released them there and what they found was that fairly quickly the adults course corrected and flew southwest to get to their target uh, location whereas the uh, hatchier birds first year birds have never migrated before just went due south so there's something built in where they just you know, just go south and there's something to do with with learning the migration route where they can then course correct and, and get back to where they want to be after they've done this a couple of times the once maybe a big part of it is surely the ability to sense the Earth's magnetic field. So we know that migratory birds and migratory bats both can do this. Um, so you can put them into a Helmholtz coil and you can manipulate the magnetic field and you can have these bats or birds head off 90 degrees opposite from where you would expect them to go. So they are sensing you know, where they are on the planet in, in that regard. So there's some of it is, is surely that. Bigger questions beyond that, there's, there's lots more to get into in terms of how they do this, of course. Yeah, I'm definitely jealous of uh, that that ability to know where you are in space. I don't have very good grid cells in my brain, I think. <laughs> um, very jealous. Okay, so next question is from Alan Berkowitz. If the bats use torpor at a stopover site, um, which he says it looked like that was happening during the day, though perhaps I misread that. So if the bats are using torpor at a stopover site, how do they gather food? So yes, they are using torpor during the day. So my, the migrating bird model is that the birds would fly it, they migrate at night, they're nocturnal migrants, they arrive at a stopover site, they feed all day, and then they can either just spend the night and then feed again the next day, or when they're ready to go, they can get up and they can migrate that night. <clears throat> Flip it upside down for bats. They're flying all night and then they arrive at the stopover site during the day. They then shut down for the day. Bats are not active at all during the daytime hours, so they are using torpor during the daytime periods. So when they're alternating between these nocturnal flights and daytime torpor and then another nocturnal flight, that's exactly the kind of question is when would they feed? They don't, they don't seem to have a whole lot of opportunity to do that. We, we've got, there is some um, evidence to show these bats are feeding to some extent um, at these stopover sites and it's probably opportunistic. Uh, if they arrive at a stopover, so our, our study site Long Point's on the North shore of the lake and the southbound fall migration. So as they're arriving at a potential ecological barrier, it may well be that many of these animals decide rather than risking going across this, let's just stop, come on down, we'll deal with this tomorrow. So they've got a bit of time be before the sun comes up, they can do a bit of foraging then. Hmm. Or on those bats that stay that extra night, they'll sneak out in between um, some of those, those rain showers and go and get a bit of food when they, when they can. But one of the other really interesting things that out of uh, Jeff's work, uh, this is my student, Jeff Clerk, we were, we were looking at some of this the bats that he was getting in, in, um, in New Mexico. And what it looks like is probably happening is that they're actually building up a fat store before they start migration huh. and relying on that primarily to fuel the migration because they don't spend a huge amount of energy at these stopover sites because they're using torpor. They can build up about as much fat as they need for the whole migration. And then basically just hit the pause button. So fly all night and hit the pause button during the day and then resume that flight the next day. So rather than draining the tank and then refilling it, I think what's happening more so is it's, it's just kind of slowly declining over time as they're migrating. And every once in a while, they'll just kind of top the tank up a little bit when they've got a few minutes here or there to, to grab a quick bite to eat. Um, is that, that's, that's more the thing. It, the other line of evidence that would suggest that's probably also the case, I did some work years ago looking at um, flexibility in organ sizes and migrating hoary bats actually have reduced digestive tracts relative to non-migrating hoary bats, which would suggest that they're not, they're, they're, they're reducing the mass that they have to carry of their digestive organs to make their migratory flight more efficient. But they're also not relying on having enlarged digestive tracts to facilitate rapid refueling. They're just kind of opportunistically grabbing a bite to eat here and there when they can. Yeah, um, Clive Jones asked a similar question. Do insect eating bats eat as they go? I'm thinking like drive-throughs, but... <laughs> So th this is this is an ongoing. Uh, that's that, that's another really good one. Right? There, there there has been suggestion of the, the the fly and forage model, and there there are different schools of thought. There, there there's some people would suggest, well, yeah, why wouldn't they just as they're flying along, they're echolocating anyway, then they can just go and grab that moth that they happen to pass while they're flying. And there's certainly they may do some of that, but from a from an energetics perspective, I don't think it really makes a whole lot of sense to be constantly ducking out of your way. You make much more sense to just get up and go, get where you're going, and then forage. Because 
trying to grab something as you're migrating, you're, you're neither migrating efficiently nor foraging efficiently. You'd be much better off to do one and then the other. And I think there's time to do that, especially if they can carry over some of this energy store. Yeah. The, 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 the classic systems for fly and forage migration are things like ospreys that are soaring, right? So not spending a ton of energy. But as they happen to soar past a lake, if there happens to be a big juicy fish right there, then okay, fine, I'll go and I'll grab that. But if there's nothing, then I'll just keep going. And, and, and so they're sort of foraging opportunistically in that regard, but there's no real cost to that for them. Whereas for these bats having to constantly detour, I think that that cost would suggest it'd be more sense to either forage or fly, but certainly there's some evidence that they are doing some foraging during the migration season. Yeah, we have, uh, we just have three minutes and I have two more big questions to ask you um, from the audience. Um, Amy Schuler here at Cary asks, do you see any other noteworthy migration patterns or habits by the pregnant female bats? Anything that would further inform wind or turbine policy? Short answer, no. Not because they're not there, but because we just don't really have a good way of actually getting at it. Um, one of the things that we're working on now is really trying to get that westward expansion of the MODIS network so we can do that kind of work. Um, the biggest challenge to working with migrating bats is that you can't just go out and catch them wherever you might want to. They're, they're really hard to catch because other than coming down to roost, they're up above and they're aerial foraging. They're more like trying to catch a chimney swift, if you're, if you're familiar with bird work, than trying to catch a white-throated sparrow. So there's really only a few spots that we know. There's a site in New Mexico that I know I can go and catch some migrating bats there. There's a site on Lake Erie that I know we can catch some bats there. But we don't really have the luxury of being able to go out and try and catch them in different places. So the place where I can catch migrating female hoary bats, there's not hardly any modus infrastructure yet that would be able to track them away from where, where we catch them. So that's coming and hopefully we'll be in the next couple of years, but we're not there yet, unfortunately. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, the, the like sort of basic limitations of our ability to study basic biology is, is still so fascinating and um, kind of mind blowing to me. Okay, last question, I think, hopefully we have one minute left. Um, how might ongoing climate change be expected to affect the energy consequences of daily heterothermy? Might warmer nights reduce some of the energy savings of daily torpor? but I'd also expect that the cost of returning to max body temperature might be reduced. So it's, it's an interesting trade-off because the, the, the decision, you know, to, to whether you use torpor or not, there, there's that trade-off between how low are you gonna be able to go and reduce your metabolic rate by how much, but then what's it gonna cost to warm back up again to normal body temperature? The colder you go, the more it costs to warm up. And so there has to be some minimum amount of time to break even, right? So a, a 30 second torpor bout doesn't make sense because it's gonna cost you more to warm up than you save by going torpor for that bit, it's unrealistic, but you get the idea. Yeah. As we get climate change and things start to warm, then the potential energy savings is reduced, but the cost of rewarming and the, the cost of maintaining new thermi are also gonna be reduced. So there, there's gonna be some interesting dynamics in there. Um, all else being equal, generally animals don't want to use torpor as much as possible. There are, there are downsides to it. There are negative consequences, there are costs. So it may be that this actually works out that these animals could if they really wanted to, but they don't have to anymore. And so there, there's, it's, it's a really interesting hmm. um, set of, of trade-offs that we have to get into there. Yeah, well, I have a ton of questions to ask you. I'll save them for later when I get to talk to you in person. Thank you so much, Liam, for this amazing talk. And um, we'll see you hopefully in person soon, as soon as yes, uh, you. you're able to cross the border and get over to us. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thanks to all of our attendees. Have a great day.